Russia has been in deep trouble for months, retreating and losing territory week by week. And this week, the Tsar himself tries to do something about it. This week sees a full shakeup in the Russian high command. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to The Great War. The Allies had tried and failed again last week at Gallipoli, with huge casualties, and the situation there was grim. The Russians had lost even more land to the Germans, but took a load of Austrian prisoners in the south. The war in the skies heated up in the west with bombing runs all week. The Armenian genocide grew ever worse, and the Indian army secured its borders. To start off today, I'm not going to talk about a country or a front, but about a man, and it's a man I haven't yet mentioned. On August 31st, one of the most daring and brilliant pilots of all time, the Frenchman Adolphe Pegoud, met his fate. Pegoud was a test pilot for Louis Blériot before the war, during which time he flew the first upside-down flight ever, was the first pilot to make a parachute jump, became the second pilot to loop the loop, and was the first flying ace, first to shoot down five or more planes. He died this week when he was shot down by one of his pre-war students, German Unteroffizier Walter Kandulski. He was 26 years old. Kandulski and his crew later dropped a wreath for Pegoud over the French lines. We haven't talked very much about the Western Front over the summer, mostly because there weren't any large offensives. And indeed, this week, there weren't any either. Just a week-long artillery duel. Yep, just. Though this was a relentless pounding of colossal proportions that never, ever stopped. But there was a lot going on behind the scenes in the planning stages at this point, which I want to take a look at. Now, the French High Command was determined to launch a major offensive this month, ideally to break through the German lines, but also to try to take some of the pressure off of the Russians, who had been retreating for four months now. But there was a lot of disagreement in the French High Command about exactly what they were going to do. General Joseph Joffre was in favor not of a breakthrough on a narrow front that could be fairly easily plugged, but a wide-ranging series of multiple offensives that would support each other and cause confusion in the German high command, foil the accurate deployment of reserves, and eventually break the lines entirely at a decisive point. Ferdinand Foch had ideas along the lines of the British bite-and-hold tactics, which would be much more methodical but restrained and would involve a series of meticulously planned steps that would depend on the range of the artillery. General Philippe Pétain, who was now in charge of the 2nd French Army and a rising star, saw the war in simple terms of attrition. He believed the winner would be the last man standing, and his strategy was mostly defensive, and was designed to conserve manpower with the occasional limited attack to avoid large-scale losses. Thing is, None of these were really wrong, but they didn't really present any coherent solution considering what the Western Front was like by September 1915. The German lines, day by day, grew stronger with more trenches and more barbed wire. They now even had concrete fortifications as well as deeper dugouts and self-contained defense stations. They also had an entire second trench system back a couple miles behind the lines that was not within Allied field artillery range. It also didn't help that the Germans were, at this point, masters of the sky, thanks to the interrupter gear they had developed over the summer that allowed their pilots to fire their machine guns through their propellers. Okay, German numbers on the Western Front had been a bit down, since many soldiers had been sent east to fight the Russians. But what would the French do against the increasingly well-entrenched Germans? Well, Joffrey's solution for that was to take a page from Mackensen's book, August von Mackensen being the German general whose artillery had precipitated the Russian retreat in the first place. Joffrey planned, to put it simply, to blast the German positions from the face of the earth. And to do this, he demanded more and more heavy artillery, so that it would be roughly the same numbers as his field artillery. And by this time, the French had 4,646 field guns and 3,538 heavy guns. This was Joffrey's battering ram and they began to plan for the day when the hammer would finally come down. And speaking of the Russian retreat, the Germans had been forcing the Russians back in Poland and the Baltic and driven them from Warsaw and Kovno. And this week, they were advancing towards the Nieman River and the last Russian stronghold on it, the fortress of Grodno. On August 30th, German forces stormed the city of Lipsk, less than 30 kilometers west of Grodno. And south of the Nieman, they advanced on the Grodno-Vilnius Railway. 
On the 31st came the first reports that the devastating German heavy artillery had been brought up and was shelling the fortress from the west. There was not much hope left for the Russians there, for at every point those guns had been brought to bear, they had blasted their way to the goal, no matter how strong or modern the defenses. Indeed, Grodno fell to Field Marshal Paul von Hindenburg's army on September 2nd, after they forced a crossing of the Niemen River. The four historic Russian frontier fortresses, Kovno, Novogeorgievsk, Brest-Litovsk, and Grodno, had now all fallen, and the Germans, set their sights on Vilnius, the most important of the western cities of the Russian Empire since Warsaw had fallen. But the Russians had, by abandoning the entire Polish salient, shortened their front from a thousand to six hundred miles, which of course gave them a much better economy of force. So they could now send reserves to the Baltic and the center, and to even counterattack, as they did at Lutsk on the first taking 7,000 German prisoners, and also in South Galicia, where on August 30th they took 4,000 prisoners and 30 big guns. But the demoralization of the Russian army after the months of retreat and loss was undeniable, and there had been rumors about changes in the Russian leadership for weeks. And this week, those rumors became fact. The Grand Duke Nikolai was dismissed as commander of the Russian armies this week and would be replaced by Tsar Nicholas himself. He would be more the new head in name, though, and the man who would really direct the armies was the new chief of staff of Stavka, General Mikhail Alexeyev. But the Tsar's future, as the now personal leader, was now really tightly bound to the successes and failures of his armies. Those armies were now divided up on three fronts. The North, now once again under General Nikolai Ruski, the West under General Alexei Evert, and the Southwest under Nikolai Ivanov. The Grand Duke Nikolai, after his removal from office, was appointed Viceroy of the Caucasus on the 3rd. Minister of War Alexei Polivanov, who was very much against the Tsar taking personal control, announced this week that Russia would raise another 2 million men, and in a related note, German General Hans Hartwig von Bessler was appointed the Governor General of the former Russian territories of Poland, now in German hands. And this week we also saw once again that it was indeed a world war. In northwest India, the Indian army again defeated the Bunarwal tribesmen, this time at the Malandri Pass on August 28th. After two more skirmishes during the week, they were finally scattered on September 2nd. And in German East Africa, British mounted infantry beat the enemy near Maktan. Further north on the Italian front, the Italians took Monte Sista on the 28th but unsuccessfully assaulted the bridgehead of Tolmino September 2nd. And that brings us to the end of the week of a war fought on three continents by soldiers from five. The Russians radically changed their high command even as they finally have some success counterattacking, but lose their last great European fortress to the Germans. Plans are being hatched on the Western Front as the artillery pounds away and the first flying ace dies. It's true what I said earlier that setbacks to the Russian armies would now reflect upon the Tsar himself, which is why the cabinet nearly unanimously opposed it. It would be a few days before it was all official, but still, the Tsar was not a military strategist. Having said that, the man he replaced, his cousin, Grand Duke Nikolai Nikolaevich, had never commanded in the field before the war broke out, and he was suddenly given command of the largest army ever put in the field in history up to that point. Okay, he didn't do all that badly, all things considered. But you would think the Russians would want a real field leader in command. You'd be wrong though, since Russia continually moved incompetent officers up through its ranks in a system riddled with nepotism, patronage, and political intrigue. And it reflected in the field. We've seen so many Russian failures that could have been prevented, that have resulted in hundreds of thousands of needless deaths. But all too often, the feeling of the Russian leadership was, so what? It's only men. The Russians had been retreating since the beginning of May when the German Gorlitsa Tarnov offensive kicked off. If you'd like to see our episode about how that all got started, you can check it out right here. Our Patreon supporter of the week is James the Pony Theorist, which is pretty cool. James's contribution on Patreon meant that we could improve our digital map and our animations. If you want to help make our show better, check out our Patreon page. And for more in-depth discussions on our episodes, you can subscribe to our ever-growing Great War subreddit. See you next time.